It is hard to know even roughly how many have died since the president of the Philippines said he'd kill anybody involved with illegal drugs. Certainly thousands. Will the International Criminal Court investigation of the deaths ordered by President Duterte do any good? Or is he, in fact, as some argue, actually doing good himself? As one witness to the street murders was heard to say, he is slaughtering us like animals. Yet Rodrigo Duterte is more popular than ever in his own country, even as critics say that what he's trying to do can never succeed and will only bring more drugs and more deaths. Determined, belligerent and unrepentant. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has presided over the killing of thousands in an anti-drug campaign. Now the International Criminal Court is examining whether there's enough evidence to investigate him. Go ahead and proceed in your investigation. I find me guilty, of course. You can do that. Are critics right to accuse the president of murder and human rights abuses? Or is Duterte protecting his citizens? With nicknames including The Punisher, as Mayor Rodrigo Duterte forged a reputation for being tough on crime, attracting the attention of human rights activists. In 2016, he earned a decisive victory in the presidential election, promising to eradicate drugs from society. Hey, wala akong pasensya dyan. Wala akong middle ground dyan. Either you kill me or I will kill you, idiots. His methods have been controversial. Government figures show at least 3,900 people have been killed in anti-drug operations. The number killed vigilante style is highly contested. Some human rights groups estimate the figure could be more than 12,000. But is his war on drugs the only way to clean up the problem? The president's strong rhetoric and the violence on the streets have caused concern in the international community. Uh, we are concerned with human rights, with the extrajudicial killings, uh, uh, impress uh, upon him the uh, need for respect for the rule of law. Duterte cursed Barack Obama for criticizing his campaign, threatening the US-Philippines relationship. But he has since reached out to US President Donald Trump, who has praised his tough stance on drugs. 16 million vote people voted for him, but uh, uh, regrettably, he, he has been shown to be a mass murderer, so we should uh, approve him. In December, Duterte told human rights activists to go to hell after ordering police back to the front line, stating drug crimes had risen in their absence. But despite his defiance, could The Hague bring about the divisive president's downfall? The preliminary examination of the situation in the Philippines will analyze crimes allegedly committed in this state party since at least the 1st of July 2016. So is Duterte within his legal right as president to enforce such a brutal crackdown? Is this the only way his supporters, fed up with drug crime, can feel safe? Critics fear the human rights violations are headed towards the establishment of a dictatorship. Rodrigo Duterte remains defiant, certain his anti-drug campaign is legal and necessary. Well, joining us via Skype from Zurich is Sasragando Sasop, columnist for the Manila Times. With me at the round table, we have John Collins, Executive Director of the International Drugs Policy Unit, part of the London School of Economics, and Jean Alcantara, who's a reporter for ABS CBN, the Filipino channel. Not working there at the moment, Jean, and we'll find out why in just a moment. But, but Sas, can I come to you first of all? Described in our reporter's package there as a mass murderer, Duterte, and yet you've written in the Manila Times not only right what he's doing, but necessary. Could you explain that? Yes, it is necessary. Because, number one, we have to examine the context of action of President Duterte. What is the Philippines in the geoeconomics of the drug trade? It is one of the major hubs. And if you're going to examine the report itself of the U.S. State Department all the way back to 2010 or 2009, it indicated there that there are a lot of foreign um, narcotic drug 
um, drug cartels operating in the country. But, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because um, there are other ways of dealing with drug users and drug addicts than, than shooting them. If I may, these are not the people getting murdered by your own president. It's Philippine citizens that are getting murdered by and large. So this is not foreign traffickers that are being targeted. I, sir, uh, let me just correct. Let me, let me just um, finish my sentence because, first of all, the order of the president is not to arbitrarily kill everyone. You know, if this is the problem with international media, it's only focusing on what the president is saying as an aside. But his order all the way back to July 2016 is for law enforcement to only shoot if their life is in danger. If you're going to examine the, if you're going to examine the statistic, over 1 million people actually surrendered. They are alive. 121,087 people were arrested. They are alive. 4,021 died in the operation. So in, in enforcing um, drug operations, these people, the drug pushers, are armed. What do you want drug, uh, police officers to do? Well, I, I, I mean, we, we know that children have died as well, but I'm saying there are other ways of dealing with these people rather than but, just but, arbitrarily but, shooting them. I mean, and it's, but, it's not just me, the media, saying this. It, this but, is, David, but David, you forgot to mention that 618 minors were rescued from the illegal drug trade, and that's a statistic that's not being mentioned in international media. Why is that? I, I, I have no idea what you mean by rescued, but we have lots and lots of evidence around, you know, people with not enough money to buy sneakers are being found with Glock pistols. Apparently they have enough money to buy a Glock pistol, and it's the same story again and again, that the police say, oh, well, they opened fire on me, on fire, they opened fire on me, we fired back and killed them, and we found a Glock at the scene, or whatever um, gun think, it is. So I, there is a, clearly I, a lot of impropriety happening around these extrajudicial killings. No, I'm, no, I'm gonna, no one is well, denying We'll come back to this. This is not just a discussion between the two of you. I want to bring Jean in on this. Okay. Um, you've campaigned against... Duterte, you, you led a demonstration outside the Parliament building, and you have yes. received, I believe, quite a lot of abuse for this. Yes. Well, uh, we, so we um, did this uh, demonstration in front of Parliament uh, against the extrajudicial killings in the Philippines. And uh, after that, uh, the, the diehard Duterte supporters, led by uh, Sasotir, uh, really started attacking me. Uh, there were about 8,000 8, attacks on me just for raising the issue of uh, extrajudicial killings in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, people were just uh, aghast at this because uh, when you question what the president is doing, here come the attack dogs led by Sasot, and they, they just go for your neck, really. Do you, do you agree, Sas, with what he's saying? Oh. Uh, Gene Alcantara is certainly lying through his teeth. I did not lead the attack against him. Well, did you, know you did you write anything that was detrimental to him? Um, I actually wrote something about him because he was threatening Filipinos who supported Duterte of deportation. Well, that that is a lie because I didn't. No, do that. no, no, Gene. Gene no, I, I didn't do that. That you that, that was your Duterte interpretation, Sasso. Of deportation. No, that was your interpretation, and what you did was to, to get people to say, ah, yeah, the, this guy wants to uh, deport Filipinos. Why Jean, would I deport Jean, Filipinos? Jean, Jean, That's my Jean, job. I'm, I help Filipinos Jean in the UK. Gene is not my interpretation. Filipinos in the UK can testify against you under oath that you threaten them of deportation. OK, this is getting a bit personal. We'll, we'll get on to the broader issues and come back to just some of those other comments in just a moment. But, John, let, let me ask you, first of all, in, in reading some of the comments that you've made, it seems to me that you are against this primarily because you don't think it will work. You may have moral grounds to be against it as well, but you just think it, it's, it's inefficient what he's doing. Well, sure, I have my moral opinions and I think they're pretty clear, but ultimately um, I, I'm an academic, right? I study international drug policy. I have done for over a decade now. Um, what we know is this has been tried before. This President Duterte's model of waging an all-out war on drugs and the citizens or whatever you want to call it, we have seen this many times before. And what we've learned in the past is that, firstly, it just doesn't work, right? The U.S. tried to incarcerate it, its way out of the drug problem. Didn't work. Thailand had a war on drugs, open killings in the streets in the early 2000s. 
didn't work. The government had pretty much openly acknowledged that fact now. So to expect that what President Duterte is doing is going to have any different effect is just, it's, it's fundamentally misguided. And then what we also learned about looking at drug policies in the past is it's not about drugs. It's about something fundamentally else in society that governments try to tackle. And what President Duterte appears to me to be doing as an external observer is that this is ultimately a power play. This is about him solidifying his base at home. This is about him looking at playing strongman politics. And ultimately, it's targeting the most vulnerable groups in society, who are also the most loathed groups in society by many, and basically just giving carte blanche for people to go out and kill them. And that's what's, that's what's morally repugnant. But fundamentally, yes, it's not going to work. Sass? Um, Dr. John Collins, let me just correct you there. Um, number one, you, you said that this has been tried before. Yes. But have you ever seen any war on drugs that resulted to a million people, over a million people surrendering and volunteering themselves to be rehabilitated? It's not voluntary when the government is threatening to murder you if you don't hang no, yourself no, no, no. in that the president didn't threaten to murder them, John. This is, you know, I can mention a lot of instances. July 1, 2016. In well, hang on, hang on, hang on. We've just seen footage of the president the, threatening the, to I, just, I watched an interview with Duterte yesterday in which he said, you destroy my country, I will kill you. That is threatening to murder somebody, he, isn't it? He said, Hitler yes, had three million but, killed, I want the same. This is very clear Dr. what he's saying. But, it's not even Dr. dog whistle. Dr. Jean, you, mis you misinterpreted what Duterte was saying during the time. Because, you, you know, the context of the speech was this. The opposition, the Liberal Party, has been comparing Duterte to Hitler since the election. So what Duterte did is actually played along, along with their logic. OK, we'll just come back, the... come back to my question and answer it directly. You destroy my country, he said, I will kill you. That is threatening to murder somebody, is it not? Um, I think it is actually... Um, an intention to protect your country from anyone who would like to destroy it. What would you do with someone who would like to destroy your country? No, but you said, you said he, he hasn't murdered anybody, and I'm saying he's threatening to, has, to murder people but, here. But, but has he murdered anyone? Well, he's, he said, by he's, his own acknowledgement, he, yes. He says when he was mayor, uh, he has shot people. Well, this is, this is where we're waiting uh, for the ICC to conduct its preliminary examination, because uh, there, there are actually two main witnesses from when uh, President Duterte was still the mayor of Davao, when he was uh, the supposed head of the Davao death squad. And two of the leading uh, killers, uh, assassins, whatever, uh, are now outside his system. One is in hiding in the Philippines, and one is in hiding outside the Philippines, waiting exactly for the ICC to commence its, its work so that they can tell their story. But there is a problem here, is that the ICC doesn't even know if it has jurisdiction over, over what he's doing, because he says that criminal cases are going through the Filipino courts, and the ICC can only act if that isn't happening. Correct, John? Well, that's, that's the logic, but I think that's a debatable point, whether the Filipino courts are actually independent at this point. Which, which it isn't. Uh, they've tried it already in the Senate, and in fact, the president's son and, uh, and uh, his son-in-law were being questioned, and they couldn't get anything out of these people. Uh, the suspicion is that um, uh, the vice mayor then, Polong Duterte, is actually a drug lord with a dragon tattoo on his back. But when he was uh, challenged to show this tattoo, he just laughed because apparently the mm. president told them, uh, respect my right to silence. So let, let me ask you one particular thing. Uh, you, you write, some of us are disgusted with Duterte's methods. Uh, do you stand by that, or from what you've been saying, do you think everything he's doing is, is perfectly all right? Well, some of, a lot of people are disgusted by you his methods. You said some of us in your article. Yes, some that, of that us. That seemed to include you. No, it's some of us Filipinos, you know, I'm including me within <laughs> Filipinos. Some of us, meaning some Filipinos are disgusted by it. But the thing and is... Do you understand that? That, that they are disgusted. Yes. yes, I understand that they are disgusted by their methods. But the thing is, you know, before you con condemn something, you have to understand what's going on May in I the Philippines. question? Like, for example, Dr. Dr. John, do you speak Filipino? No, I don't. Do you know the culture? Uh, I have visited, but I do, not, I do not claim to have a how great many expertise times, how many, in the Philippines. How many times have you visited the Philippines? Uh, once. Once. So did you study Philippine um, history? 
Uh, I've studied Filipino no, I re policy. Th this is not for you to interview John or for John to interview you. This is to get out our, our, our broader policies here. And I, let me go back to you talk about a million surrendering, and we can talk about yes. this with John as well. Uh, in the same interview I watched yesterday with your president, uh, he said the country cannot afford rehabilitation facilities. So what is going to happen? You said they're going into rehab. What is going to happen to these one million people? What's going to happen to this one million people is that they're going to be rehab they're going to wait to be rehabilitated. And that's where the international community must step in. Instead of condemning the country, it must help the country rehabilitating these people. So you but are saying that the international community must pay um, to follow through a policy with which it disagrees, which has been brought about by a president who is quite okay with killing people? No, what I'm saying is that the international community must recognize this as an international humanitarian crisis. One million pause, drug pause, addicts... One million people have turned themselves in because of Duterte. That's no, a humanitarian they, crisis which he may no, well the, have caused. No, the humanitarian crisis is that they are, drug, they are suffering from drug addiction. That's the humanitarian crisis. If they didn't surrender, then they would just continue being... Um, losing their lives to crystal yeah, meth. Yeah, please, so, so you just basically uh, negated the idea that I should have any input on this because I'm not a Philippine expert. And I don't claim to be a Philippine no, expert. No, I'm, excuse no, me, no, excuse I, me, I didn't, I didn't interrupt in your last one. I'm a drug policy expert, right? This is what I focus on. This is what I study. I look in many international contexts. And the first point is, you're saying you've got one million quote-unquote addicts who have surrendered and that we need to treat them. No one in the international community would look at that and say that's a solvable situation. The first thing is, for, for, for treatment to work for substance dependence issues, it needs to be voluntary. It needs to be community-based. People have to work in their communities to manage their drug dependence issues. And, and it's not about simple binaries between somebody being a drug addict and not being a drug addict. It's a very complex social problem. So the idea that, well, we've rounded up a million people now solve this is just absolutely ludicrous. And these people did not voluntarily give themselves up. They were afraid of being murdered. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to let Jean jump in here. I think the other thing that uh, we need to look into is the fact that uh, the, the, the ordinary Filipinos are getting killed. But actually, uh, the president is not looking at the uh, source of this problem. The drug lords continue to operate freely. Uh, I mentioned the, the uh, vice mayor uh, recently, the son of President Duterte. They were accused of um, uh, smuggling 6.4 billion pounds, about, uh, I guess, about 120 million pounds worth of drugs uh, through the Bureau of Customs, and nobody said anything. And th these drugs just disappeared into the ether. So, uh, you know, even, even his family is involved. He's not really getting rid of the, particularly the Chinese drugs dealers. So... Gene, let, let me ask you this. Um, when it comes to other issues in, in the Philippines, and John mentioned it was, it was about power rather than about drugs, uh, when it comes to other issues in the Philippines, um, he's popular at the moment, but are there other issues perhaps related to this, you talk about corruption here, that could prove to be his downfall? Well, uh, of course, corruption is a big one uh, because uh, even before the election, um, Senator Trillanes, one of the opposition senators, uh, accused him of hiding... Uh, 2 billion pesos in his bank accounts. Which is about, it's about 50 million. 40, let's say 40 yeah, million dollars. dollars. And uh, of course he said, no, there's no truth in this. Uh, and of course, he never came out with this information. So he got voted in by people uh, under false pretenses because he said he's a poor man, he slept under a Colombo, uh, mosquito net, and he wore slippers. Uh, in the house. So is, is anybody in the Philippines tackling corruption? Well, this, this is a difficult question because he has let out all the uh, people who have been indicted for corruption uh, from jail and he's now surrounded by these people. There's, I mean, the, the heads of different uh, uh, departments now, uh, there are questions about their uh, integrity. And uh, so it's hard to say he's anti-corruption Mm. when he's actually supporting all the people who have been proven to be corrupt. Just let, let, let me ask you one thing. Um, he's two years into a six-year term, I believe. If at the end of his time as president he has brought down the number of drug users, 
uh, drug addicts have been treated, isn't the problem simply going to resurface, as it often does? When, when you push something some one way, um, it doesn't disappear, it just appears somewhere else. Well, I think the problem here is that we, we think that the president is only dealing with the drug problem by enforcing the law. It's not, it's not the only thing that he's doing. You know, you know there are, he has a lot of policies um, meant to uplift the lives of ordinary Filipinos. So I think um, a lot of discussions about him only centered about his drug policy when in fact it is a totally comprehensive policy. You know, the Department of Social Welfare and Development has its own program in order to help people get out of drug addiction. And that is a social welfare policy. And no. you do no. have the Department of Health that has its own um, program um, in order to help these people um, overcome their drug addiction. So it's a, total, it's a comprehensive policy. Okay, so you, and you, 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 you're suggesting that what he's doing will, will make society better and healthier in the Philippines, John? Yeah, I, I think what I, I'm long term. I'm, we, we've ended up turning this into a discussion about the president, which is fine because ultimately the president is the face of this policy. He's the one who, who, who claims to own it. But fundamentally, we have a question here about what's happening in the Philippines in policy terms and what will it produce for the society. And so forget about President Duterte, forget about the personalities involved, creating a situation where police do not have the level of oversight that they're supposed to have under a rule of law system, where vigilantism is seemingly to be encouraged, where people are being murdered in the streets and people are being rounded up. How, does, how do you as a society in the long term move back from that? How do you move back from a situation, you claimed it's, it's in pursuit of the law, I would say that it's in direct contravention of the rule of law. How do you build an economically stable and politically stable society without a rule of law? That's my big concern for the Philippines. Dr. Um, Dr. John, um, let me just um, correct you there. The president didn't order the police to arbitrarily kill anyone. All his speeches in front of police officers were meant to direct them to only use force when their lives are in danger. Your, your question, as I gather, is about um, how, how we're going to get out of this. I think we are missing another picture here. What, what is the drug cartel doing in fighting back? You know, we are only seeing one of the belligerents in this um, situation, and that is what the government is doing. And, you know, there is a paper that was written um, about how drug cartels are do, uh, fighting back and they're, and they're unleashing violence against a government that is meant to destroy their business. So if you're say, telling me that the vigilant, vigilantism is the handiwork of the president, you are absolutely wrong, John, because there are already evidences um, surfacing that these deaths are also being perpetrated by the drug cartels. So if the, if the government becomes soft, against the drug cartels, they will also do, gonna do, they're going to kill. They're going to kill anyone who will not remit. They will kill anyone who would rat out on them. And I'm not um, excusing the police here because the police, some, a, lot, a lot of police officers are actually involved in the drug trade. That's why this situation is very, very Let's difficult. bring in Gene. Let's bring in Gene. I've got a question for you, but please respond. Okay, well, David, you asked earlier if there are other issues that need to be tackled. And there, there are other big issues. For example, uh, China. You know, the president has totally uh, withdrawn any objection to China taking over the, uh, the Spratlys, uh, Scarborough. This, and now, these are, the these are the islands surrounding the Philippines, yeah. which uh, the, actually the Philippines won in The Hague in an arbitration that uh, it actually is in the Philippine uh, you know, area of uh, responsibility. Now they're also working on Benham Rice, and they've even named the, the islands there in Chinese. But the president and his men just keep defending, saying, oh, no, we can't go to war with China. But so this is principally about, about the, the, in quotes, war on drugs. So let, let me ask you one thing, Gene. You, you don't work for the TV network that I mentioned at the moment because the moment. they don't necessarily want to be associated with your personal That's feelings right. against the Philippines president. You talked about the online abuse you received after the um, protest outside mm -hmm. parliament. Are you in any way worried that this could lead to, to harm to you and your family or anything? Well, certainly, uh, for, for when, when uh, Sasso uh, goaded uh, her, her supporters to attack, my, uh, to attack me in, in, in terms of this immigration threat, I had, you know, the, out of the 8,000, a lot of them were not just swearing. Some were saying, Mamataika, uh, which means die. 
uh, harm on my family, uh, and so many other things. So it's, uh, it's a very unpleasant situation to be in. Are you worried for your life? Yeah, of course. If I go back, uh, I could be killed there. I'm just a nobody. I'm not even big. I mean, the big ones like Senator uh, Laila de Lima is now in prison for having dared to start an investigation into the, into the drugs problems in Davao. So, uh, when, I mean, this program, uh, with respect to you, David, it's, it's, it's a good program. But after this, I know that uh, Sasot's uh, trolls will start attacking. Well, them. OK, well, we will have to see. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's not long enough. We could go on uh, for another half an hour, maybe even a little bit longer than that, I'm, I'm sure. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sas in Zurich, thank you to my two guests here. And we mentioned, of course, the um, ICC preliminary investigation. No word yet on whether it either has, that's the International Criminal Court jurisdiction, or whether it's come to any sort of conclusions. In fact, whether it's managed to interview any of those uh, said to be involved in that drugs policy in the Philippines. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you to my guests. And uh, I hope we have your company next time. From me, David Foster, and the team. Bye-bye for now.